service begins in your Advent booklet on page 9. Page 9. Uh, we hope that you will take this booklet home. There's some uh, a wonderful Advent meditations, uh, something that you can build a family devotional around if you so choose. Uh, you can see what's happening, and uh, there's also a little separate insert, uh, a little purple insert, uh, that explains a little bit more. But our service begins on page 9. Hope that you'll take those home and then bring them back for next Sunday. The Lord be with you. And also with you. As we enter the season of Advent, we believe that the love of God the Father will be with us. We believe that the grace of Jesus the Son will be with us. And we believe that the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us and abide with us all. We believe. We gather in preparation and hope. We gather in expectation. We gather in celebration. Yes to nature. Yes to love and flesh. Yes to the one incarnate for the world. Yes to the redemptive story of God. With preparation, hope, and expectation, let us celebrate. We say yes to you, Lord. We believe.
we believe this Sunday you will do a mighty work in us and transform us more in the likeness and image of your Son, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
He shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth.
Sunday at Lance, bear witness to the spectacular glory of God. These glorious plants remind us of the radiance of the one who made them and loved us enough to make a way for our redemption by sending his precious son into the world. Hear the words of scripture. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it, the splendor of Carmel and Sharon. They will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God.
monument and prophesied for centuries, then heralded by a multitude of the heavenly hosts, an event that would change our world forever. Here are the words of Scripture as we anticipate the arrival of our Savior. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. The banner herald this good news. May he grant you according to your heart's desire and fulfill all your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Thank you. 
Good morning, church. Thank you, everyone. We especially want to thank those who helped collect the greens earlier this week, and especially those today with all the music and the Michael Ray and worship band. We thank you so much. I would like for you to wrestle with something with me today, something about hope. You know, I wondered this past week whether hope is a limited resource, whether hope has a shelf life, or can be exhausted. I wonder. Uh, my mom always says to me, don't get so stressed, don't get stressed, you're gonna get sick. And my mom is always reminding me, you know, you have adrenals and they release these chemicals in your body and if you get too stressed, they're gonna run out. You know, your, your adrenals don't last. You need to rest a little bit. I wonder if it's the same thing for hope. I wonder if hope can be uh, exhausted or if it's a limited resource. I wonder if you might think that too. Over this past week, I looked into uh, the story of one man that I've uh, followed through the years. I'm not going to say his name, I'm going to see if you can guess who he is. He was a naval pilot in Vietnam, shot down over North Korea on October 26, 1967, and taken POW. He was tortured, which included being hung by his broken arms. He had his legs shackled. He was often thrown into solitary confinement. But he resolved never to give in to his oppressors. He found a way to cope communicating with other prisoners. He learned, for instance, while as a POW that Neil Armstrong had landed on the moon. And when the, his captors pressed him for names, he often gave the offensive line of the Green Bay Packers. All while he was sick and ill and going through this torture, because he was a captain uh, or in charge, uh, they would focus on him. He always managed to help his fellow prisoners of war, helping to bandage them, helping to care for them. One time he used his own cast to bandage the wound of another. He prayed and for two years he hoped and he survived until his final release from prison. Anyone know who it is? John McCain, late Senator, Arizona Senator John McCain. And I wondered, if I stub my toe and I get into a bad attitude, does hate hope persist? Looking at John McCain, I wonder, does hope persist? I learned something about hope from reading his story. Hope is a result of trusting in a future that may or may not materialize. Hope is a conviction that looks beyond today and looks beyond yourself. It's the will to stick around, and it springs from inspiration to serve others, even when the cards are stacked against you. And this today brings us to the genealogy that we find in Matthew chapter 1. Now, my question to you is, why do we always skip the genealogy? You'll even notice in your Advent book that the at the part of Matthew 1 that Jean wrote, read today was verse 1 and verse 17. It's because I didn't want to torture any deacon with having to read all of the names in that long genealogy, nor did I want to, for you to endure hearing all of these names listed. And often, when we come to this part of the Christmas story, these genealogies, which we find both in Matthew and in Luke, we usually just skip over them. We don't read them. We don't pay any attention to them. But my argument today is we wonder whether hope has a shelf life, is to take the genealogies seriously. They will not be included in scripture if they didn't mean something. This past week I was looking through some old journals. I keep a box full of my journals. I've kept journals for a very long time up in the attic. And while we were getting our Christmas stuff down, I happened to come upon that box and I wanted to see what I had written years ago. So I got that box down and I covered way back all the way to before we had kids, before I even met Christina, all the way through meeting Christina, mission trips, struggles in my uh, previous jobs uh, before I was a minister, and all of these things that I read. But one of the things we stumbled upon was a journal that I kept for Haley when she was born. And one of the things I made sure to do for Haley was to keep a family tree. And I had this elaborate family tree, mostly of the LaGuardia side, because I don't really know the maternal side too much, mostly of the LaGuardia side, which sprawled across two pages. And I hope that someday that will mean something to Haley, to remind her who she is, 
and to remind her from when she came, and now of course with Hayden here, as a reminder to him as well to take seriously the roots and his family from whence he comes. Some of you may either have been gifted with or may give a gift to your grandchildren of maybe a subscription to one of these popular genealogical websites like Ancestry.com or something like that. Many times grandparents give this as a gift to young ones because ancestors mean something. And in our Christmas story, as we begin with this beautiful lighting of the green, which we've done for as long as this church has been here, we join Matthew and Luke in walking through the generations that led eventually to Jesus. Forty-two generations in all, from Abraham to the Messiah. And this list includes some really uh, crazy characters. You have, for instance, Rahab, who was, we think, a prostitute who helped Joshua and the band, Joshua's band of spies and uh, the people of Israel to come in in order to take Palestine. Rahab is in Jesus' family tree. We also have Ruth, who is not Jewish at all. She's rather a Moabite, grafted in through joining God's story so long ago in the book of Ruth. We also have, of course, David. Uh, David, of course, being that king to whom God said, from your offspring I will bring about the Messiah. But even King David wasn't perfect. He was a misfit too. You might recall that God made that covenant with him in 2 Samuel 7. And not four or five chapters later, in chapter 11, David's eyeing uh, the next door neighbor's wife. And of course, has the husband killed and takes his neighbor's wife as his own Bathsheba. He wrote in Psalm 51, My sin is ever before me. You ever wonder if you're worth the Lord's love? You ever wonder if you're worth Christ's salvation? Just remember, David, there's always someone out there worse than you are. And David is the one who said, With all of the things I've done, my sin is ever before me. But Psalm 51 states that God loved and saved him, for he was even a man after God's own heart. I think about my own ancestry. Perhaps you think of yours. A lot of people ask me, uh, Joe, are you related to Mayor Fiorello, the, the late New York New Dealer mayor from New York? And I have to say, according to legend, because there's a family argument about that, and we're going to set the record straight today. It's according to legend. Fiorello LaGuardia said he never had family. My grandpa and my great-grandpa argued that they were cousins. Somebody writing, a, writing an article on my grandpa, who was a featherweight champion at the time, uh, wrote that my grandpa was Fiorella, or my great-grandpa was Fiorella's nephew. My grandpa and great-grandpa almost got sued for saying that great-grandpa was Fiorella's nephew by Fiorella. And so they had this big fight in court and, you know, blamed it on the journalists. But genealogies matter. And today we can't skip over them. There's something special about them. And it's more than simple record keeping. It's a, it's a testament, those genealogies in Matthew and Luke, to the longevity and the persistence of hope. Every name in that the, uh, genealogy represents the persistence of hope. And each name bears witness to the people that we can go back thousands upon thousands of years from Jesus all the way back in Matthew's Gospel to Abraham, but even further back in Luke's Gospel to the very first man, Adam, to say that for each one of these individuals, they joined in God's grand narrative, seeing beyond themselves in an attitude and posture of hope, even in the midst of their failures, knowing that God would redeem God's people and allow God's people to become swept up in that grand story of redemption and salvation, of royalty, of being princes and princesses of the Heavenly Father who is King. They knew whether or not they failed that God would redeem them later generations. They knew that even in the midst of war, or famine, or disease, or neglect, that God will not give up on God's purpose and God's salvation. That in the midst of victory and abundance, or loss and tragedy, which we read throughout Scripture, Israel never gave up on hope. And each name echoes the praise and affirmation that those who trust in the Lord shall be saved. And those who look upon the Lord in hope 
will not be let down. They moved when God said, move. They endured against all odds. They waited when God says to wait. And that's something else about hope. That kind of hope that is fashioned over thousands of years knows instinctively, and, and I hope that you get this, because this is point number two. Point number one is hope is trusting in a future which may or may not materialize when you're persistent. The second thing I want to teach you today is the fact that hope in God always deals with the what, but not always the how. For every name in these genealogies, some of them had the what without knowing the how. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, leave your whole family. Go to the land I will show you. How? Just go. Abraham didn't know how. In fact, he, God promised that Abraham would be a father to many offspring, and they were well on in childbearing age. Sarah was barren. He had the what, but he didn't have the how. But because of hope, he trusted in God. Look at David, who even after messing up and after going through that political conspiracy, still had hope in God. He knew that someday one of his offspring, David's offspring, would be the Messiah. But you have to remember that the first baby that Bathsheba gave birth to died. It was one of the, uh, it, it just happened that that baby died. And so David had the what, the promise but was very unclear and uncertain, not only in his future, but also in himself of the how. And let's talk about Joseph for a minute. In the following weeks, we'll read about how an angel comes to Joseph and Mary, but Joseph for today, to tell him that his betrothal, his, his fiance, is pregnant and will bear a child. Joseph had the what? But I would assume that if he was like me and as anxious as I am, that he stayed up late at night thinking about the how. You see, how is he going to take care of this fiance who is pregnant now out of wedlock? How is he going to explain to his friends and family when they do the math about the pregnancy and the wedding? How is he going to take care of this child who God is telling him through these angels that he will be the one to save the entire earth? How will he do it? Now you can say, well, you can always go to the Bible. Joseph was a good Jew. He knew his Bible. And if he read his Bible, then the natural thing to do is to listen to what it says in the Bible, which would have been to stone her and kill her. So Joseph has a decision to make. He has God's what, but we're very uncertain about the how. And even though he knows his Bible and he knows what the Bible says, he knows that God's word through the Holy Spirit comes to him in a new way, in a fresh way, in order to give him new marching orders, and he cares for his fine fiancé, even in the midst of scandal. He doesn't know how, but he knows the what. Sometimes hope is relying on the what when we're really not sure how. We've dealt with that in our own life. God gives us a call. God gives us a purpose. God gives us some kind of project. We know what we need to do, Sometimes the question is, how are we going to pay for it? Or how are we going to get along enough to make these hard decisions? Or how are we going to wrestle through in order to meet our community when our community ceases to listen to those who are believers? We have the what, but sometimes we don't know the how, and that's where hope, sometimes hope forged over thousands of years, comes in, entrusting in God's future, which we're not even sure, will materialize. We join what Paul says, when Paul says in 2 Corinthians, that hope is setting our minds on those things that are unseen. In 2 Corinthians 4, 17, he says this, for our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, not what we can see, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, the trick with hope is to fix your eyes on things that you don't always see, that you can't always control, on those uncertain days that you may face, because you believe in hope, because you believe in Jesus. I believe in hope. 
because I believe in Jesus. And there have been so many times when Jesus has given me the what, and I say how, and God just allows things to unravel. God's will and purpose brings things together. And as long as we fix our eyes on Christ, we too can have hope. We hope that Jesus came for us, that Jesus walks with us, that when God calls us and gives us the how, Jesus will come and explain to us and give us, or how to do it, when we have the what, we have the how in Jesus. And we also hope in Advent that he will come again. That the second coming will usher in that great day of salvation and redemption where God will make a new heaven and a new earth in which all of us will, in fact, dance on streets of gold. Be reunited with loved ones in our imperishable bodies and be princes and princesses in God's kingdom. Those who hope in the Lord, says Isaiah, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will, not, they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. It sounds to me like hope is persistent. That hope is an unlimited resource. And it sounds to me like hope never fails. It's very real. And it inspires in us the dreams to do what God calls us to do. It sounds like hope will be there tomorrow after all. Amen. Let us pray.